All right. So, good evening, everybody. This is actually my first time doing this, uh, recording my discussion. Of course, for the sake of your reviewer for the upcoming examination Thursday. Well, it's okay. But before we proceed, let's have a short recap of what had been discussed in the previous meeting. So, of course, uh, poetry and prose are being uh, differentiated in, in different factors, like with the structure, with the text, with the language being used. And these are, these people like Plato, Aristotle, Horace, and Longinus. So, these are um, philosophers and, of course, great uh, poet as well, great poet of antiquity. So, of course, for Plato, according to him, literature or poetry is the worst form of art because, again, it, it exercises the, the practice of mimesis. Well, mimesis is a Greek term. So, mimesis means imitation in English. Why is it that poetry is the worst form of imitation or a worst form of art? Because it actually tries to uh, imitate things twice or it is twice removed from reality. So how is that? How is that twice removed from reality uh, being explained? So let's say, for example, uh, okay, uh, let's say, for example, the, the painter could actually, a painter could paint a sky and mountain and of course with the use of colors we will be able to know what a sky looks like what a mountain looks like okay however when it comes to poet so while painting is the first imitation because the original subject is the sky and the mountain itself so the first imitation is the painting but for a poet, the only medium that a poet or a poetess could use to actually uh, illustrate a sky and a mountain are just a combination of letters. Okay, combination of letters in which, of course, in, in its sense or in its nature, the letter S itself, the letter K, and the, and the letter Y, when they, when they are... Uh, selected or written individually, they do not make any sense. Okay? Not unless, of course, we are going to combine them, we will form the word sky. Now, the problem is that the sky itself, according the word sky itself, according to Plato, is just um, a representation, okay, of the word that is being spoken. So, in itself, those letters, even if they are combined, they do not um, hold any relevance at all. Because there is no in the sky or there is no skyness in the sky. Okay, do you get it? Meaning to say, when a painter paints a sky and a mountain and the painter point that, oh, this is sky and this is mountain, then a viewer could actually uh, realize that that kind of view is a sky. But if you are a reader and you read, if you know how to read, but the problem is, what if you do not know how to read? When you see the letters S, K, and Y, of course, most likely would know that the, uh, the way how you read it should be sky. But if you do not have any background knowledge of, of the image of a sky that is actually connected to that word, then most likely you will have uh, difficulty imagining what a sky look like. Okay, so that's why for, for Plato, uh, literature or poetry itself is the worst form of imitation because it does not imitate in the first place. Okay, so I hope that is actually clear. And then for Aristotle, for him, of course, uh, poetry is okay because for him, it makes someone better or worse because nobody could actually describe, even a painter, not even a painter could actually paint someone as perfect or as exactly as that subject, okay? Of course, the painter could only 
uh, use different style. He could uh, vary his stroke so that he'll be able to, to get the almost exact shape of the nose, of the eyes, the shade of the skin, but then nobody could uh, exactly copy what is in there. That's why any form of art is just an imitation of an original. So for Aristotle, of course, poetry or literature is okay because it's it's actually challenging, okay? Because it could make someone better or worse. If, uh, let's say, for example, if you are trying to illustrate your enemy or you are trying to illustrate your best friend, since you are close with your best friend, so most of the time, you're going to uh, describe your best friend better than, than your real best friend, okay? But if you are trying to describe someone who is not close to you or someone that you are not in good trips with, then most likely, there's a big chance for you to describe him or her less than what that person deserves to be described. Okay? So that is the argument of Aristotle. And for Horace, uh, by the way, Plato and Aristotle are both Greeks. Okay? And then for Horace, Horace and Longinus are both uh, Italian or Roman. So for Horace, Ars Poetica, in his work Ars Poetica, so he mentioned that not everyone could be a poet or a poetess, okay? Because there are selected people who are born with that innate talent. So meaning to say, uh, even if you would want to create a poem or a poem, the, the talent is already engraved with someone who is born to develop such skill okay even if you have this desire even if you have this um uh longing to actually produce a poem or a poem but if you do not have a talent then most likely you're not going to produce um a result or you're not going to to produce an effective poem or poem because for again for Horace since he is after with the real essence of an art not everyone is destined to be a poet or a poetess there are only selected few okay and then for Longinus in his uh, work on the sublime he mentioned that a poem or a poem does not only constitute this combination of words it does not only revolve around diction because that diction or that choice of word should try to elevate, okay? It should try to uplift the level of poem or the, of poetry itself. So meaning to say, in order for you to achieve its effect, you should use a grandeur terminologies, something that is fit in order to uh, in order to produce the effect of feelings and emotion that the persona would want to evoke in the readers, okay? So you do not just use any word that you think is good for the, for the poem, okay? You should select carefully a word that could make or that could uh, present the poem or the poetry in a way that nobody expects it to be. So it's like uh, when you use a word in a poem or in a poetry, it should always um, amaze or it should always wow the audience. So that is the point of Longinus. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Don't forget the term mimesis of Plato. Okay, so now let us try to discuss further the subdivision of poetry so we have three lyrical poetry narrative poetry and dramatic poetry so the first one would be lyrical poetry so as the name suggests this lyrical poetry is um is a poem or the poetic structure of lyrical poetry is shorter compared to the other two and most of the time it is accompanied by a musical instrument so in ancient time or in ancient Greece, okay, uh, poet and poetess, well, most of them are poets. So they only use lyre, okay, 
to since lyrical poetry were actually meant to be sung okay so it's not meant to be read it's it's not meant to be uh digest silently it is actually meant to be sung because lyrical poetry is used in a lot of occasions even in festivities okay so there are different uh, types of lyrical poetry so we're just going to discuss the traditional one we have first off the sonnet so sonnet is a one stanza 14 line poem or poem written in iambic pentameter so i'm not going to discuss anymore the meter and the foot since uh, we only focus on the basic structure of sonnet so it is derived from the italian word sonetto meaning little sound or song so the main theme of sonnet is actually love politics and religion so as you can see with the definition sonnet is known or sonnet is usually connected with shakespeare okay but shakespeare is not the one who created or who coined the term sonnet okay so it is actually um uh it is actually someone from italy so that's petrarco or bernardo petrarch okay so let's see what is the difference when it comes to these three kinds of sonnet since most likely sonnet is distinguished uh, distinguished into three forms we have here the italian or the petrarchan sonnet we also have the elizabethan or the shakespearean sonnet and of course we have the spencerian sonnet okay so we're just only going to focus on the structure okay so please take note of the letters here and of course how they are being divided so we're only going to look at two things first is the uh, rhyming that's the rhyming pattern and the second one would be the stanza break okay so for sonnet uh, with the definition itself it is composed of 14 lines so one stanza 14 line yes actually it it is uh, normally it is written into one stanza only but to give emphasis on its structure it is being divided according to its stanza break okay so kindly look at the kindly look at how italian and shakespearean sonnet differ from one another okay uh wait let me just put it here all right well i cannot move it okay so here the a b a b a a b b a here only stands for the rhyming pattern let's say the first line ends with uh let's say and then second line add third line um and the fourth line oh wait let me see say sad mad day and then Pray. Okay, and then dad. Um, but, right. So kindly look at the words that I uh, write in the notes. Okay, so this is how the pattern stands. Okay. So this one is okay. So B A A B All right, go lang pa. Okay, 
So this letter only stands to the uh, to the pair of rhyming sound produced in each line. So for the first uh, fourth, so first fourth, fifth, and eighth line, they all have the same rhyming pattern, which is the A sound. While the second, the third, the sixth, and the seventh line, they all end with the rhyming pattern of add. Okay, that's why the rhyming pattern here is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Okay, so how about the C, D, C, C, D, C? So it's like this. Okay, so we have here, let's say, men. And then we have Ken, or let's say Ken. Uh, hook. And then we have uh, Len, let's say Len. That is a name, let's say that is a name for Len. And then we have, okay. So the rhyming pattern here is C, D, C, D, C, D. Okay, because we now have a new set of rhyming pair. So the ninth, 11th and uh, 13, okay, 13 lines, they all have the rhyming pattern of N. On the other hand, the remaining lines end, uh, ended with the rhyming pattern of OK. Okay, so that's why we have here the symbol, the letter symbol, C, D, C, D. Okay, so it's the same with Elizabethan and Shix, uh, with Elizabethan and Spencerian sonnet. Okay, so now how about the stanza break? Okay, so let us look at here. So when we say stanza break, it is only how the stanza are being uh, divided into group. So if there are two line stanza, we call that one as couplet. If there are three lines in a stanza, it's called tier set. And then if we have four lines, we have here quatrain. If there are five lines, so we call that one as quintet or synquain. And then if that is six line, it's sistet. There should be a T, sistet. And then if that is a seven line stanza, we call that one as siptet. And lastly, if that is an Eight line stanza, we call that one as octate or octave. Okay, so kindly look at the uh, stanza break of Italian, Elizabethan, and Dispensarian. In Italian sonnet, the first stanza break is octate because there are eight lines in a stanza, followed by a C step because there are six line stanza or there are six lines in the stanza and then for elizabethan there are actually three quatrains and one couplet so first quatrain this one the abab second quatrain because the cdcd there are four lines in a stanza and then the third quatrain is the ef ef and the last one, the GG rhyming pattern, is what we call couplet. So it's the same for Spencerian sonnet. So I hope that is clear. Okay, so let's try to skip some uh, slides. So the second one would be elegy. So of course, elegy is very um, emotional in its nature. Okay. Because in elegy, actually, it is dedicated to uh, to someone 
who actually lost his life or the purpose of elegy is just to try to express okay your feelings or your emotion when a person or someone or something could be um, an animal or it could be a thing that is dear to you lost so we, we do not only pertain to to life because there are people who are really sentimental and even if uh, a bracelet a letter are just things they also treat it as as if it is human as if it is alive okay so that's why in lg but in a in a traditional uh, view lg is meant to uh meant uh, i mean it is written to actually express mourning uh, to someone who passed away or someone who is already dead okay but of course there are also people who try to commemorate the maybe the importance or the significance of of the presence of that person even if he or she has been has been away or had been away okay on the earth for how many years okay so again lg the main goal of lg is of course to express self-expression uh with with being lost being lost in this uh moment of not having that important person important thing in, beside you anymore okay then we also have ode so ode is um, a classical poem that has a strict structure okay but if in elegy it tries to uh, evoke strong feelings or emotion of losing in ode it's it's a totally different thing because it's kind of positive since it expresses emotion or feeling that complements that praises Okay, or that gives high regards okay, to, to a work of art or to a person. Okay, so there are two kinds of ode, the Pindaric and the Horatian ode. So Pindar is actually um, a Greek poet okay, who created the ode. Well, most of Pindar's subjects are philosophers, king queens okay those who are holding high position in the state okay so for pindar ode is worthy of uh, being dedicated to those people who are ruling the state or who are ruling the country okay and then for horatian ode remember that according to to horace Okay, so it is actually after with Horace. Uh, according to Horace, he is actually with the importance of an artist. Meaning to say not everyone could be a poet or a poetess. So it's the same thing. For Horatian Ode, it, it tries to praise or compliments artists, real artists. Okay, maybe the personality of an artist or the art itself produced by the artist. And then for, for a more loose term or a modern term, we have homage. Especially when you are giving back something to, to the place where you were born or to a place that is really dear to you or a place that holds uh, a lot of memories, well, sweet memories and you would just want to, to feel nostalgic and would want to, to, to praise or to give at least significant time to, to illustrate or to show how grateful you were when you were in that place before and then for encomium and panegyric it's it's the same thing it so happened that here well in ode basically we try to praise or compliment people who are well known who are influencer but for encomium or panegyric it's more on uh, giving praises and compliments to a normal person but since poem or poem is highly personal, okay, so it's up to you if you're going to treat that particular person as someone worthy of emulation. Let's say your mother, okay. For others, your mother is just a normal person. But for you as a poet, of course, you would want to, 
uh, dedicate um, a writing that could actually express how grateful you are and how strong, how powerful your mother is. And that would be in the form of encomium or in panegyric. Okay, encomium is very private. Meaning to say, you write that uh, ode for you to, of course, express how grateful, how thankful you are with the existence of that person, let's say your mother. Okay? So, you actually write that one, read that one in private. But in panegyric, it's the same thing. But you have this desire to let others know how you feel about that person. Well, most of the time, this panegyric uh, is used in, in a program, in the opening program, especially when you are, uh, when the speaker is trying to introduce maybe a presenter or a speaker or if there is this um, initial message from let's say from the mayor or from from the one who is assigned to give the introductory message okay so that's the only difference between encomium and panegyric and then we also have idle or pastoral so for idle and pastoral it actually comes from the uh, word idle, as in I-D-L-E. So meaning to say, you're not going to do anything. Of course, in other culture, not doing anything is actually doing a lot of things. How? Of course, uh, doing something does not only include you moving physically. Okay, your mind, your spirit needs to be relaxed as well so there should be um, a relaxation or a rest time for your mind and for your body especially for your spirit okay so that's why uh, idol or pastoral poem suggest peacefulness suggest um being contented of what you are who you are where you are okay but of course, in, in a pastoral po uh, poem or poem, uh, most of the time, it is highly descriptive because it tries to, to give off a feeling of being in a peaceful place, being in, in a place that could be analogically compared to Garden of Eden or in a place that you would want to just lie down relax and not think of any issues or problem that are confusing you that are interfering with your everyday activities especially the the horrible the horrible everyday news that you that you heard from from radio that you read from newspapers okay so if you would if you would want to to write or you would want to read uh, a poem or a poetry, a work of poetry that tries to uh, evoke a feeling of peace. Okay? So you should read idle or pastoral poem. Then we also have psalm, or in Filipino, that is awit. Okay? So if in ode, it tries to compliment or praise uh, a well known person, an artist, officials in the government or just a normal person in some everything uh returns back everything points back to just one subject and that is god okay so it doesn't matter if if dawit or the psalm uh, expresses uh, joy or is lamenting okay it all falls back to to god okay so that would be he is the main receiver or the main uh recipient of the phrase of the compliment and then of course for song actually song is our song has been continuously debated if song should be included in lyrical poetry since most of the previously mentioned poetry i uh, use instrument as accompaniment to to give somehow 
um, additional factors or element to make the lyrical poem or poetry more enticing. Okay? But for song, it's more like it does not focus on the content itself. At first reading, at first um, hearing of the work itself, of, of that literary work, you do not easily focus on the lyrics of the message. You focus on how the melody is played or how the sounds are being combined to, to effectively uh, to effectively convey the message that the composer originally worked. Okay, so the old sonnet, elegy, idol, they're all concentrated on the message. So the main point of the other lyrical poem is to actually convey strong, powerful message. But in song, it's, it's a different thing. Others would argue that even without the lyrics from a song, even if you just try to hum or try to play the instrument, you would know what the lyric is all about. It's as if just by hearing the sound played by the instrument, because there are a lot of musical instruments used okay, in a song, unlike in the classical lyrical poem, where in most of the time it is only about the the liar okay so in in song it's it's like you play the music or yes you play the instrument it produces sound okay and of course even without the lyrics itself even without the words itself you could actually imagine the lyrics playing on your mind or the lyrics uh, that are crossing in your one ear going to the other ear okay so that's why song is somehow not considered as as a form of poetry because it most of the time it tries to deviate from the normal structure because if you notice all other lyrical poetry adhere to strict pattern and form okay and then we have the 21st century version and that is hyper poetry well hyper poetry is not for everyone According to Horace, not everybody could be a poet or a poetess. Why is hyperpoetry hard? I myself cannot actually create a hyperpoetry because it needs an advanced knowledge in ICT. So since it involves hypertext link and hyper markup, so you need to at least have a background when it comes to to programming language so most of the time you need to at least know what html is because in order for you to create hyper poetry you need to to generate or you need to create um, a program that could actually make words pictures images videos move or play in in a website or uh, I'm not sure what is the term for that uh, in in uh, well I'm not really sure for the term maybe in a tab or in a browser wherein you can actually apply those programming languages so this is only a website no in which it tries to create random poem through this uh, I think this is um, a newbie programmer or a programmer who is into literature as well. So here, there is um, a structure that you can choose with. There is haiku, sonnet, and whatever. And then after choosing, you may choose any uh, theme for the poem. But of course, it is fixed, meaning to say whatever structure and whatever theme the, the creator of this website uh, encoded in in the in the program those are the only thing that you may choose with and after clicking generate poem bingo okay a random combination of words are produced to actually create a poem and if that is actually haiku then most likely there there will be only uh, 
575, 17, uh, 17 syllables. Okay, so words that only contain 17 uh, syllables. Okay, so that's it for lyrical poetry. Now let's proceed with narrative poetry.